tiene mercy. It's episode 24 of Electric Fan Cave on electricfeast.com. I'm Corrigan Vaughn up here in the Central Coast. Down in the OC, we have Miss Kristen Laterell. And live from Los Angeles, we have first class comedian, YouTuber, author, and Twitterer Sarah Benincasa in the cave. We're going to talk about her life, her books, her career, and let's face it, her awesome dog. And if we find the time, we'll talk about some other pop culture things. But don't worry, folks, you'll be entertained. So let's get it. Um, I feel like by way of introduction, I should point out, like a million years ago on Twitter, Sarah tweeted, uh, you know, innocently enough, she tweeted, I would pro- I will probably do your podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just open to anyone out there. Uh, I think at this point you had your follower count was in like the hundreds, if not low thousands, not to the point where it is now. Um, and so at the time I did not have a podcast nor any inklings of a podcast I would have. But for some reason I was like, I feel like I should remember that. Uh, so as soon as I had a podcast, first thing I did was make sure that Sarah made good on that. So thank you very much. Of course. <laughs> this is so exciting. I'm so stoked to be here. I'm I'm just to give the, the listeners, just to set the stage, I am in my living room in Toluca Lake, in which is part of the city of Los Angeles, but it's in the valley. And uh, <laughs> my dog is next to me playing with her octopus toy. And I'm holding the octopus toy while she goes crazy uh, <laughs> on, on it, uh, just going bananas. So if you hear like dog growling or, or things, that's that's her. That's not me. Yeah. And if you're wondering why you're just like shaking around on the other end of this. Yes. <laughs> if you see a furry body pass, if you're watching it and you see a furry body pass through the screen. Yeah. And if so, yeah. that's... Yeah. That's Morley Safer, my dog. Yeah, Morley Safer's a pretty cool dog. If you follow Sarah on Instagram, um, if you found us by way of Sarah instead of through listening to our show regularly, you've probably seen this dog who... If you just saw, is- I'm sorry, if you just saw <laughs> something move across the screen, that was Morley Safer dangling her octopus in front of the webcam to indicate that I was not spending enough time or paying enough attention to her. Oh, Apologies. <laughs> It's good. So we'll look forward to those uh, interruptions throughout this podcast. And um, <laughs> as dog people, or at least I'm a dog person. I think Kristen, I feel more so than other animals, right? Yeah, actually, my parents are had just got a new dog this got weekend, dog. Oh. and he's amazing. Oh my goodness, I love him so much. <laughs> <laughs> he's so cute. I took this picture of him. My mom was making dinner. I was at my parents' house, and he's just lying in the. He's a chocolate lab, two-year-old Aww. chocolate lab. And he's just lying in the middle of the kitchen floor and my mom's like stepping around him and I took a picture and my sister-in-law is obsessed with dogs to a kind of almost a creepy level (laughs) and I was like oh look bomber's helping with dinner and she about lost her mind she was like oh my gosh he's the most amazing dog ever I'm like he's literally just lying in the middle of the floor (laughs) that is the most amazing thing really is what it is but he's yeah he's pretty rad so we we're having a good time with him so far cool I love labs Morley Safer is a Brussels Griffin mix so is Gaucho yeah my dog otherwise known as Creeper Dog is also a Brussels Griffin mix they make for weird little dudes don't they they're um well I read about them and they're known as Velcro with four legs they love to be near you or on you or just physically in your presence very close to you and they also are really good they're good at doing tricks and like um, they're very smart dogs, but they're, they, they bond really tightly to one person. Yeah. See, Kristen's like incredulous over there. She's like, smart, really? <laughs> Listen. Just recount the story because Gaucho one time, they were having some issues at their old house and they had this like past this door from the kitchen to the hallway. And then, but you could also get to the hallway from the, the living room <laughs> and they had the door closed from the kitchen to, and that's how he would usually go into there. Yeah. And so he sat there at the door completely lost. Like he'd never been in the house before. Because he's like, oh my gosh, this door's closed. But how do I get to the hallway now? And Corey's like, yo, Joe, like you can come around this way. Like talk, telling him to like follow her. And he's just like, no, no, no. This is the way that I go. <laughs> he would have Therefore, starved to death. Therefore, I will wait here until this door opens. For yeah. Me. Well, that was probably the, the non-Brussels Griffin. Yeah. Part. That's that was, like the Chihuahua part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think she's part, must be part Chihuahua or like some other kind of terrier. She was dumped up in the desert when she was like uh, six weeks old. Oh. And, and up in Hesperia, and, which is a really high kill shelter because a lot of people in California go and dump their dogs up there just in the desert like be free Ugh. 
People are so, so dumb. I know. They're the worst, right? I mean, I no. know. Uh, <laughs> Ours is a rescue as well, but we have no idea what strange what circumstances he came from. But uh, yeah, he's is, he is Velcroy, but he is very smart. The only thing is he's very stubborn. So you can't really get him to do anything he doesn't want to do. Mm -hmm. So that's like when he does things, it's like super cool. Like he can do backflips and all the kind yeah, of stuff, but he would never yeah. do it on command. It's like, <laughs> just when yeah. he feels like it. Yeah, it's just so. Yeah, the, your description of Brussels Griffin completely makes sense. All of a sudden, I understand my dog a little better. So thank you. Oh, yay. I feel really good about this. Right it's now. like Caesar Chavez, but not. What? You know, the guy that <laughs> what? But you know, Caesar Chavez. He's Chavez. that guy that does the dog show, and he like he's <laughs> <"Hey>, that dog. <laughs> that's Caesar <Hey>. Milan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I was like United Farm Workers. That's what I was trying to think. Like we're all together. We're united. Me Mexico, my, you know, oh, uh, yeah. desert. Uh, I was like grapes, grapes marching. I marching could not to California. Uh. But Ooh. you know what? I always I oh, got wow. I get um James, James Garner R.I.P. and Robert Wagner confused a lot. I and, feel, yeah, I feel and, like I don't know. I couldn't name a Robert Wagner like film. So beautiful. well, he yeah. used to be married to Natalie. That's yeah. Good, and there's <laughs> the all this like yeah. drama surrounding her death, and yeah. So James Garner just died, and I was like, "Is that the Natalie <gasps> guy?" And my boyfriend was like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he's Jim Rockford. Hello. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, that's that's funny. Now I'm gonna have to like look up a picture of Robert Wagner and and see because that's literally all I know is I'm like oh it's the guy with the the boat and the Natalie Wood yeah, thing. I don't something know. happened and they really don't look that much alike. I'm just dumb. <laughs> well, so I I had problems with Ed Harris and Gary Sinise for like understandable. Years. They were in everything together. Right, like they while. were just like in stuff. Yeah, like in the '90s. Yeah, they were adjacent to one another a lot, mm -hmm. and I just. Always yeah. Tom Hanks was involved also. Mm -hmm, exactly. You had Apollo 13, which had all three of them. And mm -hmm. then you had Forrest Gump, which had two of them. And then Ed Harris was always popping up doing something or other somewhere. So, yeah, I get it. Yeah. I l I'm glad you get that. Most people have the look Kristen yeah. just gave me. Like, that yeah. doesn't make sense at all. I don't, I don't know. I figured it out now because I, I watch a lot more Ed Harris things than Gary Sinise things. I always but... get Gary Busey and Nick Nolte confused. Well, that's because they're that's the same person. Yeah. yeah. That's the one I'm um, always like yeah. still even when Gary Busey is doing the Gary Busey commercial I'm like wait is that Nick Nolte or Gary Busey yeah. which is my for Gary Busey yeah commercials. that's my favorite commercial on the planet have you seen <laughs> that Sarah where he's uh what what's the tv thing that he's it's doing? Amazon oh, it's Amazon Fire TV Amazon Fire TV. or well it's like Fire TV okay. you can like search with your yeah. voice and he's like look for Gary Busey <laughs> and he's like so like He's Monkey. so weird. It's just like all the weird things you think about Gary Busey, they're playing off of them in this commercial. And like, it's worth Googling. Like, you should YouTube this video and you'll be like, you're right, this is the funniest commercial on the planet. I think that wow. he's showing self-awareness. Right. I appreciate that and poking fun at himself. Yeah, you always feel a little better about celebs that seem like they're going crazy when you're like, okay, he seems to know it. <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. Like, maybe they're not insane and they're just they're just a little eccentric you yeah know? like once in a while when lohan would make fun of herself like right early early breakdown lohan mm -hmm. would mock herself like samantha ronson era lohan yeah and she would occasionally make fun of herself that then i was like oh lohan's all right man she's in yeah. love and like life happens and she's young totally and then as time went on i was just like lohan are you okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah no exactly i feel the same way and so this gary Busey commercial definitely puts you in like oh you're all right you, you've You'll figure okay. your ish out. It's okay. Um, well, let, let's start, and maybe we'll do like a, a truncated version of this because I think we have a lot of talk, just a lot of stuff to talk about here. But we like to get top threes okay. from um, our guests on this show to get to know you a little better. Um, and so Kristen and I thought uh, an appropriate top three to ask you would be your three favorite young adult novels and it doesn't have to be of all time it can be like the ones right now that are like you know really come to mind but what are three you you love and you'd recommend okay so i'm gonna go with all time because that's just mm. what popped into my brain all right sweet um i would go with wheatsy bat by francesca leah block i love francesca leah block she's wonderful so i would go with wheatsy bat 
the the little novella Weetzy Bat, and mm -hmm. it's collected in a collection called Dangerous Angels. They also have individual ones. Um, there's a whole host of Weetzy Bat novels. They're fantastic. They're great. Uh, they really capture a time in the late 80s and early 90s in Los Angeles that I think is really beautiful. And so there's that. Um, great. I love... Uh, from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. Yes, classic. Who which doesn't? Which is great. Yeah. You know, that's a children's book, but mm -hmm. I think you can enjoy it when you're in the young adult stage. Absolutely. As well. Yeah. And I would say, huh, what would be my third? There are so many to choose from that it makes it really difficult. <laughs> called The Chosen by Chaim Potok, which is really great. I and have heard it's, the name. Yeah. It's about um, a young Jewish boy growing up in Brooklyn in, I think, the 60s. Maybe, no, probably 50s. Um, that's great. So The Chosen is also wonderful. Okay. That's good to have that recommendation because it's one that I've seen the name of and, you know, seen on a million Goodreads shelves and things like that. But I've never, I have no idea what it was about or... It's great. It it's really okay. wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. Those are good recommendations. And then what do you think, Laddie? Uh, iTunes, uh, top three? Yeah, let's do that. All right. Top three. What three songs do you constantly play over and over right now or all time? Whatever. Uh, I play the Indigo Girls doing uh, covering Dylan Tangled Up in Blue. Wow, I I can honestly say I've never heard that, but no, it's a very it '90s lesbian thing to do. <laughs> Love uh, it. Yep. So I and I really appreciate '90s lesbians. So there's that. <laughs> Who doesn't appreciate '90s lesbians? They I were amazing. Lesbian. They were so. It was a great era. But um, so that I would say that I would say I listen to a lot of. Um, Stevie Nicks doing Landslide. Mm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Big fan, big fan of, of Landslide or Silver Springs. Or uh, Silver those Springs, are both beautiful. Which is great. Silver Springs was supposed to be on Rumors, it was, but it ended up being a B-side to another song that was released huh. after Rumors. Hmm, I did not know that. It's so, recorded as part of the Rumors uh, sessions. Wow. Go figure. It's just one of those songs, you know. Well, it come from the MP3 age, you know, so it's like I just have MP3s of it, so I know right, nothing about right, the recording. Right. That's good and then the third song I would say that I listen to the most, I listen to a lot of Bob Seger lately doing really? Ramblin' Gamblin' Man. <laughs> it's I, magical. Yeah. So you're uh, you're not like one of those top 40 listen to what's on the radio right now kind of gals, eh? I'm like a dad and mom rock kind of person. <laughs> like if you're a dad nice. or mom of a teen 20 something or 30 something right now you've got chances that are we listen to similar music <laughs> like i listen to i listen to the same crappy boring music that you do even though i think i have just named three wonderful songs uh, yeah i don't i don't think crappy or boring uh <laughs> should be used it's been, i mean when you've got a song like landslide there's a reason why everyone covers that song it's, so good it's gorgeous and wonderful um sh so you think that's good should we just move yeah. on to, yeah, to questions good and talk about yes. things let's do it thank you for those excellent top threes i feel like oh, i feel like we know you now um <laughs> so I, I i want to talk a little bit about um your youtube channel first oh, and right. foremost yeah i haven't um i haven't actually updated it in a well no that's not true i've done some stuff recently with it but um yeah youtube was sort of my primary comedic outlet for the years 2008 through 2010 I would say and then on a little bit on either side yeah and I think you're I mean when people sort of bring up your work in that era a lot of the stuff that comes up is um your your Sarah Palin and your Michelle Bachman uh which are fantastic I think my favorite though is Peggy Olson's blog uh, uh, vlog yes yes that was so much fun to do I think I only did I think I did three of them mm-hmm and oh so i might bust it out before the finale like yeah, oh you definitely should now did people like tell you like oh you kind of look like peggy or did you realize you could do a peggy impression why did you decide to start doing this people would stop me and ask me if i was um elizabeth moss or they would assume that i was her when i was younger and in new york city um i think they all assumed that mad men taped or shot excuse me filmed in new york right yeah even though it obviously does not it comes <laughs> out here in Los Angeles yep. 
<laughs> but um, so tourists, when I lived in New York, tourists sometimes would ask um, if I were her or they would go. Sometimes a few times people would shout in broken English, Peggy Olsen! <laughs> <laughs> In like an indeterminate accent. Um, so I just thought funny. that was fun. And I was like, well, I can pretend to be her in my bathroom. I'm going to do that. <laughs> and I love the way you take on those, uh, the mannerisms of her. And I think this is what makes like your other impressions also so fun for people. Like that sort of proud upturned chin and everything that you do. Mm -hmm. Was that just, did that come naturally? Did you like watch, like when I do this vlog, I want to perfectly emulate her. Or is it just... I think when you're doing impressions, one fun thing to do is, uh, one helpful thing to do is to notice, like, two or three specific physical moves that mm -hmm. someone does, and to just repeat that, exaggerate it, and do it more than they actually do it. And so you see, like, when you watch people do different impressions of different presidents, for example, sometimes they'll figure out what the hand gesture is yeah. that they do, whether it's a thumbs up, or it's a pointed finger, or whatever it is. Um, so... You'll see people do that. So the, I think the physicality of the impression is really fun to figure out. And mm -hmm. there's it's the physicality and the voice. You don't even really need to look like the person. I have right. to look like Elizabeth Moss, but you don't even really need to look like the person so long as you have that the physical, the physicality and the voice down. Mm -hmm. Then people will get into it and will go along for the ride. Yeah. And now, did, uh, was the YouTube thing sort of a launching point for any part of your career? Or was it just a fun thing you did on the side? YouTube was really fun. I remember we, we convinced the Huffington Post to pay us $15,000 in 2008 dollars to do a bunch <laughs> To do a bunch of videos, me and my comedy partner, Diana Saez, did a bunch of videos as Sarah Palin and her imaginary cousin and personal assistant, Dina. Um, we did them for a site called 236, which was the Huffington Post's short-lived um, <laughs> humor website, which ah. uh, a friend of mine, Lori Kilmartin, was the head writer for, and now she's she writes on Conan and has for a few years. Cool. And um, it's really funny to see kind of, and she's also a very talented stand-up, and she wrote a book that has an, a title I don't think I'm allowed to say. <laughs> okay, It, it starts with S and ends with mom. So it's <laughs> S adjective that is bad to say, mom, and it's really funny. <laughs> Um, she's one of the authors. And so it's been fun to see where we've all, everyone has sort of gone from that experience. But yeah, it was definitely a launching pad. It definitely got me access to television opportunities, talking head stuff, and also interviews and, and things like that. And that concurrent with the radio work that I was doing at that time between 2008 and 2010 on Sirius XM, both were really helpful, but the YouTube stuff way more so. Like way, I mean, I got opportunities to travel to Norway because of that and wow. to Germany and, and to speak on panels over there about political humor and all kinds of stuff. So YouTube, yeah, it, it really took me, it took me on a, a fun adventure. And this is coming after, obviously, as you wrote a book about suffering from, like, severe agoraphobia and anxiety and things like that. So when you first sort of broke into these traveling and doing all these things that involve a lot of being, you know, talking to people you don't know and being in strange places and things like that, had you already come to a point in your life where this was something you embraced or was it really hard for you to uh, sort of wrap your head around when you first jumped into this? Um, I started getting better. I went through a really difficult period in my life um, when I was in my late teens and early 20s and I was agoraphobic and I was, I mean, I am agoraphobic still, but I just manage it now with right. lots of medication. Yep. But at um, <laughs> the time I wasn't properly medicated. And so when I was, um, when I was 18 through, or I would say when I was 16 through 21, 22, it was really difficult. And that time is chronicled in my memoir, Agora Fabulous. And I found that what helped me was to do the medication, do the, do all of the, um, the therapy and the such that I did over time. And then I got into doing stand-up comedy, which was really fun and um, really helped my confidence. It yeah. really helped my confidence so much. And then I started doing a one-woman show called Agora Fabulous, and that turned into the book Agora Fabulous, which came out in 2012. Yes, and uh, one of our friends slash listeners, Brienne, um, just read Agora Fabulous. I don't think... Laddie, you haven't read it yet, have you? No, I'm. she's going to... 
Oh, wait. That was when she got the library. So I was waiting for her to return it so that, <laughs> yeah, I could get it. so that she could get it next. Um, but I don't do ebooks, so I have to wait yeah. for it to come to the library. So. This drives me insane. She won't touch the ebooks. But <laughs> um, uh, we've both read Grape. We haven't read Agora Fabulous yet. But my friend Brienne, she read it and absolutely loved it. I mean, we. Um, we like to tease her a little bit because you know on goodreads you have those star ratings and if yes. you hover oh, above oh, them no. yeah i'm sure as an author you're familiar if you hover above them they're very specific about what they mean and so really like two stars is like it was okay as opposed to i hate this and five stars is like this has changed my life and she adheres to those very strictly so she <laughs> very rarely ever gives anything five stars it's like she'll give something three and she was like yeah i really liked it that's what three means. Um, <laughs> That's not what three means to author. Yeah, exactly. But she she gave it a five. So I was like... Oh, that's so nice of her. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brianne. That's awesome. I yeah. really appreciate that. <laughs> and she wanted us to ask you a few questions um, sure. about that book. Uh, so she's going to be stoked um, that these are on here. So uh, her first question was um, how and when did you make the decision to quit teaching and do comedy full time? I was in a graduate program at Columbia University at Teachers College is what it's called, very creatively named. <laughs> and um, I was, it was supposed to be a one year program from 2004 to 2005. No, that's wrong. I did AmeriCorps from 2004 to 2005. Okay. 2005 to 2006 was my program. And I, you know, I guess I decided in 2006 when I started doing stand-up comedy and sketch comedy, that's when I decided, I, I called my parents up and was like, I'm going to be a stand-up comedian. And they were like, oh, no. <laughs> and um, so I didn't actually finish that program until 2008. Because okay. I, I, I left a few courses um, hanging there. But um, I... Let me think. Oh, wow. I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just looking and, and seeing that my dog has just destroyed a pillow uh, <laughs> because she's not pleased that oh, I'm no. talking. But you know what? I'm going to throw an old t-shirt and she's going to love it. So <laughs> everything's great now. Uh, oh, my God. No, you can't eat this plastic thing. Sorry. Uh, charming sorry. animals. Sorry for my lack of ideal conditions for no, this that's uh, fine. experience. Anyway. So. <laughs> I, so Morley Safer's going wild, and I, uh, I guess it was, in, it was in 2006 that I decided, you know what, this is not what I'm going to do full-time with my life. I'm going to work different jobs, because I felt that being a teacher was incompatible with what I wanted to do with stand-up comedy and with web comedy later as well. Um, I didn't want students to be able to Google me and find mm -hmm. out what I was up to. It just felt inappropriate, and, yeah. and I just thought, you know, I need to make a decision here, and teaching should take a lot out of your life. Yes. And I felt I would be too drained to do good comedy mm -hmm. or vice versa. And I didn't yeah. want to, to underserve the kids that way because there are enough crappy teachers who wish they right. were doing something else. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, good. Yeah. yeah. It's a plus. And that's, so that's when I decided to and that's when I got into it. So I guess I've been doing comedy. Oh, wow. I've been doing comedy for eight years now. That's so crazy. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's weird. I guess you probably don't think of it that way very often, right? The, mm, no, I just kind of, it's, what's the next project? What am mm -hmm. I working? What's my next deadline? You know, these days, because I'm full-time mm -hmm. as a, a writer and person who writes. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of another thing, and I was like, no, no, that's what that's I do. That's basically well, what it is, yeah. Writer and comedian, I mean, I travel around doing different gigs, and but generally I focus on writing these days, um, mm -hmm. whether it's writing for television or writing books. Yeah. So it's, it's weird. It's been a weird journey. But eight years ago at this time, I was, uh, I was like telling my parents, oh, by the way, yeah, comedy instead. <laughs> I, I, uh, just judging by some of the articles you've written and then hearing this, you're very good at just dropping bombshells on your, on your parents. Then, yes. Huh? That's sort of my thing that I do. I just <laughs> go, Hey guys, guess what? Is like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so, like, the point where every time they see you call, they're like, Oh no, what's it going to be? <laughs> They get very excited when I call. They get very <laughs> excited. They're like, yay! And then I propose an idea, and they're like, ah! Like, they were so confused that I did a Kickstarter. They were like, but you're getting paid, like, 
more than adequate amounts of money to write things uh, that you make up out of your head. You're living the <laughs> dream. Why are you doing a Kickstarter? And I was like, well, and also what is a Kickstarter? And I was like, well, <laughs> let me tell you, I will explain. Yes. And this was the, the This Tour is So Gay Kickstarter that yeah. was fully funded. Yeah. Yeah, it was fully funded. Fifteen thousand dollars for fifteen cities in the U.S. and Canada, and um, so what happens with that is that I use that money to cover my expenses and also to cover the cost of different prizes that right. I had worked out for different people, and. Um, I use that money to travel around and then in each city that I go to, the reason it's called this tour is so gay, is that in each city that I go to, I either A, um, do direct service with a, a community service organization that helps um, the queer youth community, B, do a fundraiser for that organization, or C, make a donation personally to that organization. That's very and cool. that's the last bit is what I decided to do. Um, you can't advertise that on Kickstarter because mm -hmm. that, so the way I promoted it on Kickstarter was that I would do direct service or do a fundraiser. And then after it was over, I was like, I realized like, oh, wait, now I, what if they just want money from me? I can do that too. Because it yeah. <laughs> wasn't trying to be shady or anything. I just yeah. thought about it. And I was like, well, in some of these cities, um, I can only, t in order to keep my costs down, I can only afford to go in and stay for one night. Right. So I fly, fly cheap, stay one night fly out and that doesn't give enough time to do a whole lot besides doing the event so I was like well in some of these cities I'm just going to donate some money that mm -hmm. you know so so basically contributing in some way um to each uh to each city's queer youth community that's a really cool idea and I don't think I I did not realize that that was uh the the goal here so that's pretty rad and are you going all the way across the U.S. like I'm going, I'm doing it in fits and starts. So I already okay. did Los Angeles, which was easy. That was at yeah, um, it's home. this showroom at Meltdown Comics. Oh, I and love that was Meltdown. And a really fun storytelling show about adolescence. Mm -hmm. And next I am doing Tattered Cover Colfax. It's a Tattered Cover store in Denver on Colfax Avenue. That is Wednesday, July 30th at 7 p.m. Ah! <laughs> My dog just wore out my headphones. <laughs> this is such an adventure. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really magical what's going on here. Um, anyway, so that's Tattered Cover Colfax, and that is going to be uh, s July 30th at 7 p.m. with Adam Kate and Holland and Mara Wiles. And we're going to tell stories about adolescence, and that's a free event. And then I'm going to sign some books, and then I'm going to make a donation to a place called The Center, which is the oldest and biggest um, LGBTQ center in the Rocky Mountains. So oh, wow. And so they're yeah. not all the same show. This isn't like you have one routine or anything like that that you're going and doing. You're doing something different. When you go to yeah, in every city that I go to, I'm going to tailor it to that city and to the venue. Because, like, in some cities, a small theater is what I'm able to do. And so that's going to be a different experience than in other cities. I'm going to do something at a little independent bookstore. And so I'm really kind of tailoring it to meet each city and kind of the needs of the community there and the venue there. That's really cool. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Oh. I wish that I could have been there for the L.A. one uh, and seen it in action, but... I'm oh, sure. Okay, we had a great crowd. It was yeah. cool. It was really fun. It was me and um, Yasser Lester, Dave Ross, Jake Weisman, Julianne Smolinski, and Gabby Dunn, who are all really funny comedians and writers. And um, so it was great. It was like everything from really light, funny stuff to really just dark <laughs> stuff, too. So awesome. it's, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's rad. And then, whoops. Oh, no, it's not frozen anymore. Sorry, it froze for a sec, but we're back. Uh, um, and the dark stuff uh, leads into Brianne's next question for you, um, where she said, it seems like stand-up, particularly having a show based on your anxiety issues, has been a great form of therapy and has helped you work through your anxiety problems. What advice would you give someone struggling with anxiety or depression who doesn't have that kind of outlet? Oh, I would say therapy, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, use your use your Obamacare, <laughs> or, or whatever you have. Yeah. Use it. And also, if money is a problem, um, you can obtain low-cost or no-cost therapy by going through a community health center, by going through a not local nonprofit, or 
um, you can go to a sort of any any psychiatrist or psychologist who is recommended to you, and you can ask to work on a sliding scale basis. A lot of them will do low cost or no cost, or maybe they might ask you to bring in an income statement, or if you're on unemployment, to bring that in, um, your evidence of unemployment in, or if you're on food stamps, bring in your EBT card or whatever to show that you need some help. And some of them will just, you know, just trust you and won't ask you for identification or documentation mm -hmm. about it. So it's always worth asking. I mean, you know, I once went to see a lady who was $400 an hour and I Whew. asked if she could work with me and she said she could bring it down to 275 and I said, wow, that is a huge reduction. I really appreciate that. Still not going to work for me, but, but thank you and, you know, I wish you the best. And so everybody has their own idea of what sliding scale means. So don't mm -hmm. be afraid to ask and work with somebody because I also have friends who go to people who normally charge 300 bucks an hour and who get charged 10 bucks, just wow. like a, a nominal fee. So definitely, like, don't be afraid to ask questions. That's the most important thing. Always ask questions. Yeah. And I hope everybody out there is listening because I am a huge proponent of therapy and going through that whole process. I think everyone should do it whether you think you have problems or not. I think it's Oh, I'm a huge fan. It's yeah. just like going to see Yoda. You <laughs> just go to your own personal Yoda and you just talk about yourself and then sometimes depending on the style of therapy, um, they might give you feedback or they might just the they might just listen and there are different kinds of therapists. So if you go to one therapist who sucks, um, well, it's kind of like driving a car. Like you need to try, you probably should test drive a few before you decide on one. You mm -hmm. might click with the first one immediately, but you know, give it, give it a couple shots. And if you're not into it, you can always move on and find somebody else. Yeah. That's good advice. That's a good word. Um, and, and the last question she had, which I think I would have had to have read the book to understand, but she said, how did it feel to give away Mary the giraffe? Oh, Mary the Giraffe was my beloved giraffe, my beloved stuffed giraffe who's musical, who I had since I was uh, two weeks old or something, oh and I goodness. used to carry her around with me every, like, not, not like to a restaurant, but um, when I would go traveling, I would have her in a bag always, and it was very the security blanket for me. And then, I think when I was 31, I was like, you know what, I think it's time to let Mary go, um, my comfort object, because she'd been in my kind of toolkit for dealing with agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. Comfort objects are really helpful. And I just decided I think it was time to it was time to let her go. And so I gave her to my comedy partner, Diana Saez's son, Will, um, mm -hmm. who she was pregnant with when we were doing the Sarah Palin vlogs. And at this point, I think Will was three or three or four. He was four. And um, so I gave it to gave it to him. And it was hard, you know, I still miss that, that stuffed giraffe sometimes, but it was also a very important moment for me to, to give that up. It was, um, so it wasn't just saying goodbye to a certain part of childhood. It was also saying, okay, I have my ish together enough at this point that I don't need my comfort object. Yeah. I'm still bringing my clonopin, yeah. but <laughs> I don't necessarily need my comfort object. Right. I have I have a stuffed frog that I have had oh, since oh, I was in second grade named Kiwanis that I'm like I can't imagine just giving that away but it's kind of a Toy Story three sort of moment I guess right it like was a very Toy Story three moment yeah. absolutely yes <laughs> it really was spoiler spoiler yeah but it's a, really, it was a <laughs> very it was a very Toy Story three moment and I like lost it you know of course everybody lost it when they watched that oh but my I gosh yeah particularly was like oh my life um, yeah. Kevin Smith, the filmmaker Kevin Smith, calls Toy Story 3 Schindler's Toy Box. <laughs> <laughs> accurate. It's, it's accurate. There are some moments where you're just like, what? This is horrifying. Yeah. I, I went to that. Um, they did, uh, you know, the, uh, what's what's that theater called um, in Hollywood? El Capitan. Mm -hmm. I went to the El Capitan. They did an all day, all three movies thing when it came oh, out. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, and they did like they set up like an amusement park behind it and all this kind of stuff. And and it, it set out on a tone that already I was like, I'm going to cry through this whole thing because they're standing outside and there's this lady on stilts walking through and she's talking to everybody in line and all this stuff. And she comes up and she's like, you know, uh, she's like, so the movie is came out in this year. How old were you? And did you see it in the theater? And I like thought about it. And I was like, Oh, my God, like, this was this is my life right now. Like, this is, I was like, eight or something. I'm 26. So whenever it came out, 
And uh, so I was already set up like in there with that emotional, like just ramped up, like this is my childhood sort of coming to a close here uh, at 26. And then (laughs) inside, it was like all these people who are kind of around my age and maybe a little bit older, but you knew they'd sort of grown up with Toy Story as well. And they were there with their children. Oh, wow. And so there's this whole sort of environment. And so you're watching this movie, which is like really emotional and ramped up. I mean, when they're like all about to die and they're holding hands. Ends, like yep. all this stuff and you're They're just in seeing a literal like, oven They're yeah a, the, the, literally the toys are in a literal oven yeah it's it's so apt and you just look around and there's all these like grown men with their 3d glasses on trying to like wipe their faces and just everyone was so so in it you know oh so. yeah it's wonderful it's yeah. so good and and that's i think disney is so powerful like disney and pixar all that stuff um they that imagery is really ingrained and you see what happens when you go to Disneyland and you go to California Adventure, which has like all the Toy Story stuff. Yeah. And you see how people sort of regress and it yeah. you know, hits all these deep emotional m- buttons in people. I, it would be hellish to work there. Because <laughs> you have grown adults acting like weird, creepy children. Yes. Um, because it just, it becomes part of our sort of collective pop culture unconscious. And um, it's so, it's just so interesting to see what happens there. Absolutely. I know I'm guilty of that. Laddie, do you too. have you do you ever go to Disneyland? Me? Yeah. No, I'm too poor. <laughs> well, especially these days. I yeah. was gonna say, I've never heard you so. like rave about Disneyland or anything like that. I mean that. I like going. It's always fun when we go, you yeah. know. I don't know. I, I mean I, I think I had a I've had a pass like maybe twice in my life or something and I don't know. I it's like I don't know, it's almost like a like going when it's an event. Right. So, like, if my family's going, I I love going with them, and because you stand, in, I don't know. That's you just don't want to like regularly go and regress. No, I don't really. Yeah, when I have friends, because I live obviously right near it, and so people are always like, "Oh, we're going to Disneyland tonight," and I'm like, "Okay, it just seems kind of like a lot of effort. Like, you have to go stand in line, and there's like parking." <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so lame. That's like the lamest excuse ever. But it's yeah. just like, meh. It's, it's cool, and I like it, but I don't. Yeah, well, I'm not we did. Um, it. we did go to Downtown Disney last week. We went and saw oh, the fun. um the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, preview that they were doing there. So that's and Downtown fun. Disney is accessible. You, it's basically a mall. You don't have yeah. to pay to yeah. go into the actual park. You can take a um you can take like a tram from downtown disney to disney but then you have to have tickets <laughs> yeah then comes the really lame part where you have to spend like your inheritance and your firstborn exactly you know, to get in yeah um have you ever been to universal sarah we talked about this last I week i haven't i've been to the universal like mall city um, walk like, oh. city yeah, walk yeah, yeah mm-hmm. i've been to city walk but i haven't been to universal i heard it's like dirty and weird <laughs> I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I feel like it gets a bad rap, but it's actually super fun. I was just wondering, because, like, the backlot tour is one of those sort of fun rites of passage for people who are, you know, into Hollywood stuff. But, I mean, I yeah, I am actually, Hollywood. I live really close, so I yeah. can walk there. I you should there go. I metro station all the time, so I should go <laughs> and, like, yeah. actually have the experience. Um I uh, I would like to I, I would like to go. I mean, I've gone to meetings there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like a little different of a vibe, but it's cool. A little different vibe, but yeah, that's where you. I'm developing my my memoir that we were talking about, Agora mm-hmm. Fabulous, as a pilot with USA, and awesome. so I've gone to meetings over there because USA is part of NBC Universal, and mm-hmm. a lot is over there. Yeah. Um. So I've gone over there, and apparently they have like a secret entrance that you that they can take to get into the like a some sort of back entrance they can take to get to the thing so to the amusement Whoa. park so i'm always like uh, sorry my dog again um i'm always like oh, i want to go which i've been told is not professional but i don't care <laughs> i i feel okay about that personally i think i yeah. think you should um yeah the backlot tour is kind of fun because you do you get to see all those kinds of stuff that you probably do see when you go on meetings but i mean i watched your um your set your i your i see famous people bit um, oh yeah and in which I think Kristen and I can relate a lot, just being so enthusiastic about like seeing people. And also this was super relatable because in this bit, Sarah's talking about, um, you know, at, at one point, there's a lot going on in this bit, but at one point she talks about sitting in a cafe um, 
and John Stamos entering and yeah. everyone just losing their ish, including other celebrity type people in the place, which I could relate to because I once interacted with John Stamos and just like went to pieces immediately. <laughs> it was like, oh, yeah, he's just such hey. a douchebag. He's so he insanely good looking that it's just like, what is even happening? He's and unreal. everybody lost it. Everybody in the place was like, forget it. I mean, they tried so hard to keep their cool and we, we all sort of collectively as a group <laughs> managed it. Like we all <laughs> a, a unspoken bond among all of yeah. us. And then he left and everyone, there was this great exhalation of breath and everyone just freaked out. <laughs> like we all kept it That's together. It's a great moment. Stamos, all these, all like 60 strangers. Yeah. And he left and we were like, now we can let it out. <sighs> it's just such a funny okay. thing if you really think about it because John Stamos, like, I feel like by technical terms, he's not exactly an A-lister, but he so is just by his like handsomeness and his pop culture clout and like everyone would go to pieces well he's like disney he's like a disney character and yeah. that he's ingrained in our souls but he's like the disney character of vaginas for people <laughs> of a certain age <laughs> because like we all remember being aroused by his hotness at inappropriately right. young ages yeah and so everyone was like oh, 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 <laughs> and just lost it yeah the way he said that you know have mercy thing you it know it's hot yeah yeah. his hair and he wouldn't let anyone touch his hair and I was like I respect that yeah <laughs> you do you Stamos yeah you do you. Stamos it's totally fine now is your um fangirlish uh or just enthusiastic personality something that you think has sort of endeared you to people and made them uh more likely to sort of want to work with you or does it freak people the hell out when you go into meetings and you're like ah uh, you know what it I think it's been okay because I always kind of I always kind of look at the person as as a neat person. Mm -hmm. I'm always like, oh, here's a neat human being who I can who I can talk to about the cool things that they have done. And most people respond very well to someone mm -hmm. being like, I like the things you have done. You are good right. at those things. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, like I met. I interviewed Lizzie Kaplan yesterday for Bust Magazine, and it was really nice to just sit down with her and eat pigs in blankets and be Ooh, like, nice you do neat things. Let's talk about the neat things that are neat. And it was really <laughs> fun. And hopefully the, the, you know, 2,500 word interview will be longer than that. Um, well, yeah, but, I imagine. But uh, it was, it, you know, that was really fun. And when it's come to business where I'm working with someone, like I'm working with Diablo Cody on the nice. Horror Fabulous pilot. That's so awesome. she's executive producing. And so is um, Ben Stiller's Red Hour television. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't met him yet, but certainly when I met Diablo, I was very like, I was a little geeked out, but I didn't, yeah. I, I think I just was like, thank you for doing awesome things. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Thank you for doing, you know, I, I don't think I was like, I want to be you. Yeah. Like, crawl inside your skin. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like, that's good. That's you get arrested for that kind of stuff. Right. We ended up working together, so that's cool. Um, I think, you know what, like, I, I think focusing more on oh wow you have done a cool thing is better than you are a cool person so I try yeah. to channel mm -hmm. it into being excited about the work that they've done rather than like oh I mean there's some people like I would freak out if I met Bruce Springsteen I wouldn't be able to handle that and I'd never <laughs> want to meet him because I couldn't because <laughs> it. it would just it would be I would, done I yeah. would lose it mm -hmm. but with everybody else if I can just turn on the part of me that is interested in what they've done then later I can go oh my god I spent an hour talking to that person yeah. but uh, also like we're working with ABC Signature, which is the cable division of ABC Studios, as that's the production company that's doing the pilot. So, um, so you have like your executive producers, and then there's the production company, and then there's the network. So when we go meet with the production company, which is, or the studio rather, which is um, you know a ABC is owned by Disney, we go to the Disney lot, and on the mm -hmm. Disney lot they've got all this and all these animated characters, like you know like all the animation cells and stuff. Yeah. So I take all these pictures always and put them on Instagram, and I'm like Snow White, and the, the animation building is in the shape of a hat, <laughs> of, of a wizard hat. So yeah. cool. So I, I geek out about stuff like that for right. sure. Right, totally. As you should, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, I hope that forever it always remains novel to you, you know? I that too. like It never gets to the point where you're just like, uh eh, I'm so old. It's Hollywood. I forget, I was talking to, to Lizzie Kaplan about that, and I was saying, like, I forget who, I, I was talking to her, and I was like, does it ever 
does it st- is it still weird ever? Like, I was curious about that. You know, is it still you've been acting? She's been acting since she's thirty two. She's been acting since she was fifteen. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I know this is like your normal and everything, but several. Do you ever look up and go, "Oh, I'm naked on a billboard"? <laughs> oh, right. That's interesting. Does that ever strike you in any way? Like, I'm very interested in. Um, how people who have achieved a certain level of fame and or fortune, when they have those moments that take them out of their normal mm-hmm. and make them realize, hey, this is this is pretty this is pretty wild that I get to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and did she ha- did she find it weird? I think she um, she she it wasn't too weird. I think because she doesn't see it that much because the way, mm-hmm. well, the place where the bill the billboards for Masters of Sex specifically yeah. are not in like her neighborhood where she <laughs> right. lives or on her way to work or whatever. So she doesn't see them that often. But um, I think when she does, it does she does have a little moment. I think she was saying where she's like, "Whoa, oh, okay, <laughs> I, I, all right, that's I suppose that's a good picture." So I feel good about that. <laughs> I feel all right about that. Yeah, that's good. Um, and, uh, oh gosh, I have so much to talk about in so little time. I want to, uh, talk, uh, I want to talk about great, but beforehand, there is a question I'm very interested in because obviously you do comedy and things like that. And in comedy, there's a lot of line pushing and, or line crossing and boundary pushing and things like that. Um, and I think, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would say you probably consider yourself a feminist. You talk about feminist things. Mm-hmm, yeah. And um, in fact, I think in your in your interview with uh, uh, Neil Gaiman and Amanda Palmer, you're wearing a shirt that says this is what a feminist looks like. Yes. So I feel like I'm not actually putting words in your mouth by saying this. Um, but so I, I'm curious as a female comedian, a feminist and things like that, uh, you've got people who uh, are, you know, making rape jokes and making... Um, uh, jokes that can be at the expense of women and people who manage to pull it off and be, you know, uh, not offensive with things. But how do you personally sort of find your line and where do you worry about offending people? Do you not worry about offending people? What do you, um, how do you negotiate your audience and how you want to present material that may be sensitive, but you're making light of? Um, sometimes I use Twitter as a barometer. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty active on Twitter, and so I'll throw something out there, and depending on how people react to it, that sometimes helps me to know if I should include it in a written piece, right. or if I should, um, or if I should try it out on a crowd or not. I mean, that's very, Twitter is so public that, mm-hmm. you know, you just, you put it out there and you see, there are definitely some things that I go, oh, you know, I want to say this, but no, there's been a couple things that I've put up and then deleted. And of course it's still out there in the ether, but right. I think in the act of deleting, you show that, okay, I realized I did something wrong that was mm-hmm. crossed the line for me. Um, I, I mean, I'm pretty, you know, I, I, I think that, it takes a lot for me to be like, oh, I went too far. If it's something that is making fun of a kid, mm-hmm. sometimes I'll, if I do that, I'll then feel bad about it. Like making fun of an actual child. Right. Um, like the whole Kovanjane Wallace thing last year, the, the Onion did. Yeah, I remember that. That was, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I remember that was, I, I felt that they had gone, um, I felt that was, they had gone too far mm-hmm. um i think that would have been something that would have been funny in the context of like a conversation right that had been set up differently and was not was like if, yeah. if it had been set which up which is where they called kovanjane wallace the c-word on yeah. this uh, okay. on the it's, onions twitter feed but right. it was like obviously the the joke they were trying to you know pull off there was like because that's so that's so ridiculous she's an adorable little child who is all goodness and light and they were like oh yeah she's kind of a that and I think um, also what they were doing was showing how incredibly what they were trying to do I think was to say that the public will be so nasty to celebrities they'll tear down anyone yeah. even this like wonderful little girl who's so fabulous like exactly. this is actually something someone would say on twitter probably right. and when you need to put something in that much context i think it needs more than 140 characters <laughs> yeah and it's not going to work so it was a misfire i feel on on their part um, even though i understood what they were going for um, i'm not someone who is generally like that is inexcusable under any right. circumstances when it comes to language. A lot of right. times with language, there are acts, there are, you know, behaviors that are inexcusable under any yeah. circumstance. But when it comes to language, 
you know, I, I'm not one of those, you know, extreme individuals. But in, in this case, I was like, oh, wow, that just was, I, I think yeah. I tweeted them. I was like, hey, man, not cool. Like, come on. You just, <laughs> yeah. you did it wrong. Like, just take it down. Right. Um, and, yeah, that was, I mean, that was a, com- that was complex. Um, that's probably not something I would do because mm-hmm. I, because I used to be a teacher, I am, mm-hmm particularly sensitive to making fun of kids so like the other yeah. day this girl took a selfie of herself and put it up and it was a selfie of herself at the Auschwitz concentration camp <laughs> I was like and she's smiling and she's got her makeup done and her ear and she's like oh and there is a context for why she took the photograph and right it, and everything um but oh, I, I, I retweeted it because I was like this is insane yeah and all these people retweeted it and then I eventually unretweeted it because I was right. just like you know what she's a dumb kid right some yeah. kids are stupid. Yeah. Like, I'll just, she's a dumb kid. She shouldn't have put it up. She didn't understand. And it was, you know, she was putting it up because it was the, it was, com- it was a trip she had always planned to take with her dad and her dad passed away recently. Mm-hmm. And so she was very proud that she got to make this trip in his honor and right. blah, blah, blah. And okay, that's great. But ultimately it's incredibly offensive to do that. You're stupid. Right. Don't do that. Um, and that, but it's, then I just felt bad because people who were following me were saying stuff to her. And I was like, you know what? She's a kid. She's like 15, whatever. I need to take this down. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, responsibilities. uh, And I don't want to call it a responsibility as if it's something that people should feel obligated to police. But one of the things that uh, people who are very public uh, figures on Twitter have to deal with is that if you point to any person uh, and point out something that they've done, some of your followers are going to inevitably go and attack that person. Yeah, and I realized I realized when that happened, I was like, <sighs> I mean, it's something that like I talked to I've talked to Pat and Oswald about a little bit, like mm-hmm. um, just talking about sort of his experience with something where he had made a joke that was actually had some so- social relevance, but people took it the wrong way and got really mad at him and it was dumb. And then other people were mean to those people. And it was just, I mean, he's on yeah. a Twitter hiatus right now, I think because of that reason he posted mm-hmm. a blog post about it. And it's, I was tweeting something at this particular, about this particular public individual who I felt had been an ass and <laughs> didn't mean. And Mark Barron texted me and was like, are you trying to rile up this person's fans? Because his <laughs> fans are really intense. Like, you know, do you want to... S-? He basically was just like, just so you know. like, Yeah, this is what you've opened up here. Yeah, he was just curious and he was like, he's a friend of mine and he was like, are you, you know, just... He was just kind of like flagging it for me. Yeah. I'm glad that he did and I took it down because sometimes I don't need to be called a C word. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> you know, you know at the end of the day, you can do without it. Right, I can do without it. So it's okay if, if I've seen some public figure do something that I think is awful. I don't necessarily, it's not like uh, I with my am doing anyone a service or disservice by commenting on it. I'm not that important. I yeah. don't matter that much. <laughs> and I don't need to invite, I'm not going to win any prizes for inviting that kind of rage and people right. saying like, you're a bitch, you're this, you're that. So mm-hmm. it's okay not to wade into every fight. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, that's a good way of going at things. Um, I wish yeah. that more people really thought about things that way when they get behind the keyboard and say things. Um, but re- briefly, it'll just maybe close uh, with talking a little bit about great. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, I'd because, love to talk yeah, about Yeah, we we read this. We, we we made it our book club book this month. Um, Yay! So our entire group of friends is reading great right now. Um, that's Laddie, so cool. Thank you. you. Oh, yeah. please. Thank you for writing it. Laddie, did you finish it yet? Yes. Sweet. Well, because I thought, yeah, I thought Sarah was coming on earlier. And so I was like, I better read it. Oh, and that's I was like, right. Okay, she'll be on in two weeks. I'm like, oh, well, great. Yeah, now I'm just ahead of the class. Apparently. Yeah. So, um, yes, I did finish it. Yeah. I just lied to her about when you were coming so she would read really fast. That's oh, all. that's great. I appreciate I it. Um, <laughs> now, one thing about reading this book that it, it's, incredibly frustrating to read when you're when you've read the great gatsby because the entire time you know where this has to go yeah 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 yeah. when you wrote it were there times when you're like i wish i didn't have to do this to these people yeah i i I got upset and i i really delayed it i dragged ass on writing it 
because I just didn't want to do certain things to certain characters. And mm. so I actually stopped and, and would stop and procrastinate and do other things. And yeah. I had to extend my deadline a few times, which is totally crazy because they're not real people. <laughs> they're people that I invented. <laughs> uh, but there were some, and, and I've talked to other authors who had that same experience. They don't want to put their character through certain things. Right. And then other times you take sort of like ghoulish delight in putting your characters yeah. through terrible things. Right. Um, but I just felt bad because I liked some of these people. And I was like, I don't want this to go in this direction. But I felt that it needed to. I could have changed it. You know, I could have done anything. So there was nothing saying, Sarah, you have to yeah. make this a, a, a Gatsby homage. Um, but that was just what I wanted to do. I wanted to write something that stood on its own, but that had enough sort of Easter eggs and references to Gatsby layered in that would entertain the reader. And I also felt that it was kind of a subversive feminist thing to do to take this high school novel that we all have to read. It's not, it, it wasn't written as a high school novel, but this sort of like yeah. canonical novel and make it, give it some girl power. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I always, whenever I read something, I always like to, I don't know why I do this to myself too, especially when I like something, but read people's critiques of it on Goodreads afterwards. Oh God, people are um, vicious. And it's fun, I, I don't know if you've read many of these, but one of the things that always strikes me is when people talk about not liking the characters in this book. And, yeah. and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's not, the point is really not to like them, right? Oh, yeah, Much like in not, Great Gatsby, you, you're not supposed to people. like them. Oh, yeah. they're flawed people. That my main character Naomi is um, really flawed. She mm -hmm. thinks of herself as this really liberal, progressive, cool, hip, badass girl, and actually, she has some prejudices specifically mm -hmm. around gender and sexuality mm -hmm. that um, are there. And she's my narrator, so yeah. a lot of times people confuse the narrator for the author, the author right. and don't realize that the author is actually constructing something um, and that this is art. <laughs> I'm so sorry yeah. about the. It's <laughs> It's like little sound effects here. <laughs> it's but, dog. It's my yeah. It's my puppy. But yeah. yeah, they confuse they can use the author for the characters. So they think, for example, Stephen King must be a murderer. And right. Not, and they think Neil Gaiman must be magical and a wizard. And he is a wonderful man. But he I've never seen him actually do any acts of magic oh. i'm not to my knowledge he's not actually a wizard yeah, um, i'm just saying it, it's possible but i think this is one of my favorite things about the book was um i think the way that naomi is narrating it um uh, and it is that separation of the narrator versus author but you see the sort of ingrained prejudices that people have and the way that teenagers talk um mm -hmm. and even you know the most progressive or the most conservative they all have their moments of crossing those boundaries and things and i thought that was something that was so real in this yeah. book oh great i got i'm glad because she <laughs> Definitely, all you know. Some people read it, got so angry, and were like, "But she says this. She she fat shames or body shames, and mm -hmm. she does this and that." It's like, yeah, yeah. She's, she's a teenager, a human being. Like she's a teenager. She's flawed. She has issues. She's not yeah. perfect. I didn't write a perfect character because I think perfect characters are boring. Yeah, and I like flawed characters. Right. And so she's a flawed character. Um, and so she's not even my favorite character in the book. My narrator isn't my favorite character in the book. <laughs> Who is your favorite? Skaggs, her best friend. Skaggs is fun. I like Skaggs. We don't see enough of who I want to give her own book, actually. That would be awesome. I would definitely read a, a spinoff about Skaggs. Um, Super confident, butch, yeah. lesbian. Right. Um, totally Super confrontational. Cool. Super confrontational will not let Naomi get away with crap. Yeah. She's the sort of conscience of the book. Yeah. I love that relationship that they have that's just like so no BS that Skaggs calls Naomi out when she's like ignoring her or when she's doing something stupid or mm -hmm. when she needs to get her ish together. Um, another question I have, and this is just, you know, just a pragmatic question, I suppose. How do you pronounce the name of the... Uh, the Gatsby character in this Just, book. Her name is Jacinta Jacinta. Yeah, okay. Jacinta. My Here boyfriend kept definitely calling definitely mispronouncing her. that in my Yeah, head. this was a Hermione moment. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my boyfriend kept calling her Jacinta, and I was like, okay, that's not her name, and, um, and Jacinta. <laughs> yeah. She's Jacinta. She's Jacinta, Jacinta Tremalchio, and Tremalchio um, comes from... Uh, well, Tremalchio was is a character um, in, uh, in in legend, in sort of Roman myth, but mm. also Tremalchio was the original title that Fitzgerald had for The Great Gatsby. It was uh, something about, like, the Grand Tremalchio, or I forget what it was. 
that's really cool. I love those little like Easter eggs like that. Yeah, and so that's why she has that name. And of course, she's Jacinta because he was Jay Gatsby. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool. I like that little tidbit. So you've all learned something about the book. Um, I think we we've spent a lot of your time here, and we're really grateful that you have come and talked Thank to us. This you. has been really really fun. Um, and uh, let's see, you have you have another book you're coming out with. Yeah, I'm working on three books right now, which is crazy. It's so yeah. insane. Um, it's bananas. My So my next book for young adults comes out in early 2016. That's okay. called Be- Believers. And Believers is um, inspired by Lord of the Flies, but it's with oh, nice. teenage girls from an evangelical Christian church in Texas. Mm. And they are in a show choir. <laughs> <laughs> and they crash. They crash during a mission trip on a deserted island. Well, that sounds awesome. And they go crazy, <laughs> and the the it's totally bananas and really dark and messed up. And I'm excited about it. And Great. the cover is awesome. I just saw the rough draft of the cover, and it's fantastic. Amazing. Sweet. Sorry. Yeah. And then I um I I'm writing my first novel for adults that comes Great. out sometime in 2015. And then I am also writing a funny self help book which I don't know when it comes out. Might be 2016, might be 2017. Awesome. Well, we will look forward to yeah. all of those. Um, and again, thank you so much for coming. Um, you can check out uh, Sarah on Twitter at Sarah J. Benincasa. Mm-hmm. Um, you're SarahBenincasa.com, yeah? Yep. YouTube, you're Sarah Benincasa. Yeah, Facebook. Facebook is official Sarah Benincasa. Official Sarah Benincasa. <laughs> okay, great. So you can find her in all these places. And when we put the blog up this evening, you'll be able to check her out and all of those links and links to her books on uh, Amazon and all that stuff. So make sure you check out the blog so that you can uh, get all of that and go and watch her do Peggy Olson and uh, all of her other awesome impressions <laughs> on there. Um, so that's it for the fan cave this week. Um, Thank you. We, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And we do want to announce also while we're while we're here um, that we are starting our own fan cave book club. So if anyone wants to be a part of it, look for the Fan Cave Fiction Club on Goodreads. We're gonna hang out, talk about books, geeky interests, things like that in the forums. Then we'll have Google Plus Hangouts to uh, to talk about them afterwards. So check that out. We'll put that up on the Twitter and all that stuff as well. Um, and next week, barring any last-minute scheduling conflicts, we've got Anthony Miziano, a.k.a. Harley's Joker, on the show, and it should be a gooder. Don't forget to su- subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, SoundCloud, Tumblr, and wherever else you'll find us on the internet. And if you like us and want more people to know about us, go ahead and drop us a rating or a, a review, and feel free to share us with your friends, because the more the merrier. Uh, thank you again, Sarah, for joining us. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for putting up with the dog noises and stuff. <laughs> oh, she's a treasure. Treasure. <laughs> uh, and so for this week, I'm Corrigan Vaughn. I'm Kristen Latterell. Peace out. You're like, no, dog looks like Morley Safer. Yeah, she's Morley Safer. Definitely named Morley. And now she's walking. <laughs> <on>. <laughs>